Good morning. Um, I haven't bottle fed a baby um, in a, quite a long time. Um, I'm a mother of a teenage girl, and so I don't know anything. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I'm not quite sure why I'm here. But um, uh, I do want to thank Ellie very much for inviting me to participate in this wonderful um, gathering together of scholars who are involved, um, I agree with Ellie, in a very important critique of um, intensive um, mothering and intensive um, parenting. And I, I think it's quite interesting to be here right now during the Maddie mania, um, which uh, I would be interested in talking about as part of this conference. Um, we have these every year, they're, but they're not as intense as they are in Britain. Um, in the U.S., we do, um, it's often in the summer, um, when the news cycle is slow, and there is a white, um, middle, upper middle class blonde girl who goes missing. Um, if she were an African American uh, inner city uh, girl who would go missing, there would be zero coverage of her. And then the, you know, the sort of media hysteria uh, proceeds from there. Um, but it's nothing like what happens in Britain. It's been, this is very interesting to come into the middle of this um, phenomenon. And Frank and I were talking about it earlier, and he, he uh, used a great term, I thought, which is that the, the media attention has now al almost gotten to the level of, of the pornographic. And um, y what was interesting to me yesterday as I was reading the Times, I opened up, and there was an article about based, in, in, based on this whole missing Maddie um, you can now purchase um, GPS t tracking devices that you can sew into your children's clothing so that you always know where your child is. I mean, to me, this is a kind of a level of um, hysteria that is absolutely beyond the pale, but it is interesting. I think when we see these kinds of media phenomena, they're not only about child rearing or parenting. They are um, a kind of stand-ins for cultural anxieties that have to do with broader issues about protection, about vulnerability, about innocence, including cultural innocence, um, about chance, about risk, and about control. And so I'd be interested in talking to people throughout the next two days about what people see this particular phenomenon being about. Um, Anyhow, uh, I um, would like to talk about this discursive formation called the new momism. And um, the new momism is a um, highly um, demanding, utterly romanticized uh, standard of uh, perfection, of the perfect mother, in which the standards for success are utterly impossible to achieve. Um, it is a white, uh, upper middle class rule book, but it polices all mothers. And uh, these days, certainly in the U.S., no matter what you do, uh, and no matter how much you do, it's never enough, and it's never good enough. Um, and this idealization of motherhood is dangerous, and it is reactionary. And in the U.S., it is the primary vehicle of backlash against women. Um, it certainly corrodes a mother's self-esteem. Uh, it also pits mothers uh, against each other. It over-idealizes motherhood and parenthood um, as an emotionally transcendent uh, individual <laughs> experience as opposed to a life stage that actually requires r support from the government and workplaces. It undermines women's rights and opportunities because in the U.S. anyway, it insists that issues around motherhood and the welfare of children is an individual problem. It's something that mothers by themselves are supposed to um, focus on and, uh, and, and have control over, and rather than um, having us focus on how our politicians, the government, and the workplace have failed to support mothers. In the U.S., anyway, mothers are revered in rhetoric, and they are reviled in public policy. Um, now, the new momism rests on uh, these two elements, and, and Frank and I are going to be talking about these this morning, and I imagine we'll be talking about this throughout the next two days. 
One is this wonderful term, intensive mothering, that was coined by uh, the sociologist uh, Sharon Hayes at the University of Virginia in her terrific book, The Cultural Contradictions of, of uh, Motherhood. Um, so it rests on intensive mothering, and it also rests on this very romanticized notion um, of what motherhood means and how it is this transcendent experience that allows us to vault over the existential abyss, um, which, as any mother knows, is not quite the case. Um, but uh, one of the things about uh, the new momism is that we are not only, like in the 1950s, are we supposed to be subservient to our husbands, we're supposed to be subservient to our children. And um, uh, so, and the other thing that it rests on, which Frank is going to talk about, is this, is this heightened, increasingly metastasizing paranoia about the vulnerability of children. Um, and so these are the kinds of the three building blocks. It also rests, as Ellie was suggesting earlier, on this heightened competition around motherhood. So that when, when women are young girls, they're meant to compete against each other over men by seeing who can be the most poreless and the most slim and all of the rest. But when we become mothers, the, the competition intensifies. And now in the States, um, and I, I think here too, um, not only are we competing uh, against each other in terms of all of the things we're supposed to do to ensure that our children are Nobel laureates by the time they're 12, um, but motherhood is also supposed to be sexy now. I mean, God help us on top of everything else, right? Um, and the other thing about this new momism is that it has absolutely become the common sense. It's become a hegemonic formation. And so how do you break apart a hegemonic formation? And I think that's really what we should talk about because hegemony is never fully achieved. It is always a process. It is always incomplete. And therefore, it can be contested. And I think what we're seeing in the US anyway is the way in which this hegemonic formation about the new momism is, start, is being challenged and is, is starting to crack. So um, I hope we can put a few more chisels in this, uh, in this particular formation. So what I'd like to talk about um, in, in the brief time I have um, are the building blocks that I see have gotten us to this path. And, um, and one thing I want to emphasize here, because my area is I'm, I'm a media historian, and um, so I'm going to be talking about the mass media. Now, obviously, they do not operate um, as some hypodermic needle taking values from Pluto and then injecting them into an unsuspecting population, right? But what they do do are take particular elements that are uh, operating in a culture, and they magnify them and exaggerate them um, so that some uh, kind of people and some kinds of stories and some kinds of motherhood are um, quite exaggerated and others um, you know kind of uh, diminished into invisibility and it's that role of the mass media in exaggerating some aspects and diminishing others that we need to think about here and think about what has been in it for the mass media to play I would argue a very very significant role in contributing to the notion of intensive parenting and certain to the, certainly to the new momism. So one of the things I want to ask as we're moving through this is what has been in it for the media? And what's been in it for the media? What is Maddie doing right now? I hate to be cynical, but she's selling newspapers. That's what Maddie's doing right now. Um, in the US, uh, wars about uh, the mommy wars, sell magazines. Um, the mommy wars sell television programs. Um, and uh, so we want to see how the new momism uh, f uh, functions uh, for the mass media. All right. Um, now, uh, I, oh, this book starts in the 1970s for a very particular reason. Uh, the 1970s uh, saw the rise of the women's movement globally and certainly in the United States. And one of the things that feminists did that was central to the women's movement was challenge how motherhood was institutionalized. And um, there has been a lot put out by the, the right uh, wing in the United States that feminists uh, hate uh, hate motherhood, uh, hate mothers, hate stay-at-home mothers, hate children, and nothing could be farther from the truth. If you go back and look at the um, feminist magazines from the early 1970s in the U.S., it was all about helping mothers. It was all about enabling mothers, uh, because one of the things that happened in the 1970s in the U.S. Um, was, in addition to the women's movement, was the economy went uh, south. Uh, we had a very bad economy in which we had double-digit inflation and, um, and very high unemployment. And there was a name given to it called stagflation. And mothers uh, knew how to deal with stagflation. They went to work. 
So you had a revolution uh, in motherhood in the United States between 1975 and 1985, uh, which was enabled in part by the women's movement giving mothers position, uh, permission to go to work, um, and which was propelled by a souring economy and a soaring divorce rate uh, in which 90% of the single-headed households were headed by women. Um, and so during this period, you saw a, um, a revolution in family life. And what feminists were doing were, were critiquing the institutionalization of motherhood in which women were supposed to be completely economically and emotionally dependent upon their husbands. And uh, if you look at not only the feminist uh, magazines uh, from the mid and late 1970s, but the broader, more popular women's magazines that had traditionally been geared to homemakers, they now had to be geared also to working mothers because that was now a huge part of their market. And they, uh, if you went back and looked at them now, you'd nearly weep because you do not see this intensive mothering. That's why it's important to start in the 70s because that was about throwing all the stuff out the window. So how did we get from there back to here now where I would argue it's actually worse than it was in the 1950s. And if you look at the women's magazines back then, they, uh, they seek to operate as a kind of switchboard, helping, if you're divorced, what do you do? Um, if you, you have no money, how do you afford to, to rent an apartment or a house? Well, maybe you could hook up with other single mothers and share a house. Maybe you can figure out how to share childcare. It was all about this kind of uh, switchboarding. And uh, article after article said, forget the housework. You know, now, I mean, I don't know if you have, do you have has Martha Stewart gotten over here? <laughs> oh, God. All right. All right. So this is before the Martha Stewartization of America, you know. Um, so it was very important to start from the 1970s and look at this foundational moment in which in, it wasn't even intensive mothering, but the way in which motherhood had been institutionalized was critiqued and how slowly but surely we move back to where we are now. And so um, I'm going to talk about the four building blocks of the new uh, momism. One is fear, uh, the uh, second is fantasy, the third is marketing, and the fourth is politics. Um, there may be more, but these are the four broad rubrics that I'll be talking about. Now, uh, all of these, fear, fantasy, marketing, and politics, did build on genuine anxieties. Uh, within American culture about changing family formation. Um, there was a revolution in family life between 75 and 85. Uh, millions and millions of women, not just with children who had gone into kindergarten or first grade, but with six-week-old six infants were entering the workforce. They had no role models. Even if their mothers had worked, they had waited until their children were five or six. And so there was a revolution in family life and with these kinds of cultural anxieties do get taken up by the mass media. Of course they do, and work through in a variety of ways. But there was also, beginning um, in the 1980s uh, in America, um, a backlash. Uh, there was the, uh, this was the beginning of the real uh, neoliberal uh, project under Reaganism, uh, the real uh, um, advancing of the notion that the market is the best arbiter of everything, uh, who needs government, uh, you know, I mean, we had no, nothing like a social welfare state compared to Britain, but what, what little existed of it, Reagan was determined to dismantle. And so just at the point when uh, families and mothers actually needed the kind of institutional support that would have allowed this revolution to, to move forward a little bit uh, more productively was when things were getting slashed. And so you have cultural anxieties interacting with a very determined backlash mounted uh, in part by the right wing in the United States um, as a way to put women back in their place. So fear. Now, uh, fear is very relevant right now as, as we're, we're thinking about the, the whole Maddie case and the terror that you dare leave your child in a hot locked hotel room for 15 minutes, you know, or 20 minutes or whatever, um, or that your child slips out of your um, sight at a shopping mall. I mean, you know, so this kind of fear began to get stoked in, in the U.S. in the 1980s. We began seeing in the news media missing children everywhere. Um, and there were a couple of famous cases where uh, children had gone missing and they had been abducted by strangers. This kind of um, uh, child being uh, gone missing in this way was very rare in the United States. But the news media picked up the endangered child as a news peg and began to really flog it. And so the missing child, the endangered child, became a very important peg in the, in the media. 
and one of the things that happened is you, you got, began to get a media panic uh, about endangered children, and it took two forms, missing children and daycare centers in the United States that were allegedly staffed by Satanists, child molesters, uh, you know, pedophiles, et cetera. So uh, in the missing children category, we ba the news media um, conflated uh, figures that, um, that uh, were children gone missing very temporarily in custody disputes. The father had the child, the mother should have had the child, whatever. And so uh, the news media began to, to um, broadcast these very large figures for missing children, um, which were highly exaggerated. It was quite irresponsible for them to do that. But mothers began to get panic-stricken that there was an epidemic of children gone missing. The second thing that happened was, uh, as I said, these uh, high-profile stories about daycare centers uh, staffed by Satanists and, 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 and um, child molesters. And there was a very famous case I won't go into right now called the McMartin Daycare Scandal in the, in the U.S. in 1984. And, during, and that story became a peg for story after story about daycare centers all around the United States that were also allegedly staffed by Satanists and pedophiles. Um, none of these, uh, uh, nearly all of these stories proved to be false. In the McMartin case, uh, everyone was acquitted, but there was a, there was a child m media panic ab about daycare centers. Now, um, let me just go uh, uh, briefly into what um, uh, one of the institutional imperatives around this was. In the mid-1980s in the U.S., the news uh, divisions of the networks were spun off from the entertainment divisions. The entertainment divisions had in the past kind of footed the bill through their profits to sustain the um, news divisions of the networks. That ended in the mid-1980s, meaning the news divisions had to basically make their own ratings, um, have, their own, you know, have their own bottom line, line met by their own uh, productions. And so you had increased competition amongst themselves. You had the rise of tabloid journalism in the U.S. with a variety of shows. I don't know if you had them in Britain, but they were shows like A Current Affair and Inside Edition. Um, and, uh, and so you had, and you had increased sensationalism. And all of these kind of conspired to, uh, to flog these kinds of stories. Now, I'm not saying that news people were sitting around saying, oh my God, we've got to get our ratings up, let's do endangered children. They were responding in part to a cultural anxiety about changing family uh, uh, structure in the U.S. But nonetheless, there were a whole host of anxieties that, that got uh, very much magnified by the news media. We had something called a crack baby in the United States uh, in which um, Americans saw uh, very tiny, struggling, usually babies of color uh, who were allegedly addicted to cocaine because their mothers had used crack when they were pregnant. Uh, this was a complete media uh, construction. There's no such thing as a crack baby. Um, these babies were like they were because their mothers were poor and did not have prenatal care and smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol. Yes, did some of them use cocaine? Yes, but that's not what was causing the situation that we saw on screen. So in other words, at the end, by the end of the 1980s, mothers were terrified, t absolutely terrified. Um, daycare had been uh, very much um, discredited in the, in the U.S., um, although many of us still uh, benefited from and used daycare centers. Mothers were terrified about letting children out of their sight, and that kind of fear continues to be stoked to this day. And so you, have, you feel like you have to be perennially vigilant. That's fear. Fantasy. Um, when, when I... Um, had a child, I got the kind that didn't sleep, and um, so I would drag myself into the grocery store at 7.30 in the morning. I would have been up for three hours because she was up at 4.30 for the day. It was really awful. And, um, you know, I looked horrible, you know, and unlike these celebrities, I didn't weigh less after having my baby than I did before. And so I'd be in there with wearing my husband's sweatpants and some ratty sweater and that, you know, get to the checkout line. And there were the bleachers and bleachers of magazines with celebrity mothers with their miracle babies. And um, it struck me that something was quite wrong here. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that's the other thing I began to look at is the, is the rise of the celebrity mom juggernaut. And so I did a content analysis of the covers of the four leading women's magazines from 1975 to 2000. And in the mid to late 1970s, there were hardly any celebrity mothers and their miracle babies on the covers of any of these magazines. 
By the late 1980s, between one-fifth and one-quarter of the covers of these women's magazines featured celebrity mothers and their miracle babies. Um, beautifully backlit, you know, haloed, everybody dressed in white, children in white. Um, and, the, and by this time, the articles had ossified into a very particular form. And the form had two, two essential pieces to it. One was, uh, well, three. The mother, the celebrity mother, never expressed any ambivalence whatsoever about having children. None. It was not permitted in the form. Um, the second thing was she told you, it was, they were highly, it had become highly normative. She told you everything she was doing to make sure that her child, again, was going to be a Nobel laureate by the time he or she was 12. All of the ways in which she cultivated him intellectually, physically, musically, emotionally, the flashcards, all this kind of stuff. Um, and the third thing was they, t which was the most pernicious, was they told you how, you how you were supposed to feel. And you were supposed to feel ecstatic 24-7 about being a mother, you know, ecstasy filled. Uh, one of them said, when I come home from the 12 hours on the set, my children recharge me like Energizer bunnies. <laughs> it's like, God, what family do you have, you know? I mean, when I come home from work, everyone wants a piece of me, you know? So, um, so there was this kind of fantasy. Now, who doesn't want to luxuriate into a women's magazine where uh, some celebrity pretends that motherhood isn't stre stress free? You know, sure. But um, what happened is these, show, these, these um, celebrity profiles, um, as I said, ossified into such a normative, incredibly policing, surveilling standard of motherhood. And they, they've proliferated throughout the US today. And they also traffic in a form of utter hypernatalism that has absolutely gone through the roof. So that's fantasy. Marketing. Um, when I was a child, you know, there were, to there were dolls for girls and trucks for boys and, you know, a few other things. Now, um, children are divided up into ever narrower demographic niches. And each niche is accompanied by a bleacher load of products that you better buy um, at the developmentally appropriate age or else. And um, I, there was a revolution. One of the things that was really fun working on this book was looking at the trade journals uh, for the toy industry. And the research, around, uh, the research um, targeted to children about toy development and other products uh, targeted to children, cereals, everything else, absolutely intensified and became much, much more sophisticated in the 1980s. And, um, and I don't have time to go into detail uh, about that right now, but basically there became a double-pronged marketing strategy that was much more intensive than it had been in the 1950s, in which mothers were targeted and children's, children were much more heavily targeted. And they could be, because now there were cable channels devoted specifically to children. So they could be gotten at through the ads, and then they got at you. Um, children were referred to as guided missiles of marketing. And, um, and one of the ways that this kind of um, marketing polices us, and I can talk more about this in the Q&A, although I imagine most of you are quite familiar with this, is that, um, you know, because I was, I was the target market for all this educational stuff, right? You know, these black and white mobiles that you hang in the crib so your kid becomes Einstein and, you know, all that. Um, is that the, the warning that is implicit in them, and now in the States, I don't know if, if this is true in other countries, now in the States, there are flashcards that you can use for six-month-old children. There are computer games, you know, like pre-geometry computer games for like nine-month-old children. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and um, anyhow, you know, on and on and on. Mozart for babies and this, that, and the other, um, which is supposed to make their little cognitive patterns all sophisticated. Um, and the message of all of these is if you don't buy these, these developmentally appropriate items for your child at exactly the right age, that savvy mother down the block, the one you're competing with, the one who's better than you, She's going to buy them, and her kid's going to go to university, and your kid is going to work in a donut shop. And that's the, you know, it's a fear of falling message that polices mothers as well. So that's marketing. We talk more about that. And finally, um, in the U.S., there's been politics, of course. Um, the U.S., um, and we can debate about this, but I would say, um, as an American, that the U.S. has the most pathetic public policies in the uh, industrialized world uh, for uh, mothers and children. We don't even have universal health care. We certainly don't have universal health care for children. We do not have any nationally um, uh, monitored um, or funded 
uh, daycare or preschool for children. We don't have paid maternity leave or paternity leave. I could go on. Um, and there's a reason for this because we have, we have had a very persistent um, uh, right-wing assault on uh, working mothers that is a way, in fact, to police all mothers and all women. And so daycare in the U.S. is seen as a special interest kind of privilege for working mothers that discriminates against stay-at-home mothers. You know, and it's been a very successful um, kind of campaign. Um, and there have been other ways in which um, politicians have constantly um, delivered attacks on welfare mothers, on poor mothers, on working mothers. Um, a, a mother who works is warehousing her child in daycare, so on and so forth. And so there has been a quite persistent and ongoing assault uh, on working mothers um, by the right that has manifested itself in very, very consistent public policies that are well, they're non-policies, they're anti-policies. And so all of these have, um, have uh, really uh, interacted uh, to produce what I call the new, new momism. And uh, so in fact, if we, we had a television show in the States in the 1950s called Leave it to Beaver, um, which featured you know, this suburban mother who stayed at home and cooked and was meant to be ideal and all the rest. Now, this, if we see her as kind of the uber suburban mom, her name was June Cleaver, she was not required to pipe Mozart into her womb so that her baby came out perfectly tuned, you know? She wasn't. She was not expected to drive him 10 hours round trip to a soccer match, what you guys call football. Um, she was not expected to, uh, to give him French lessons starting at the age of three. She wasn't expected to homeschool him, and so on and so forth. And so it's actually um, the standards are much more punishing, much more policing, much more ubiquitous, uh, much more threaded throughout so many channels of the mass media, from children's programming to the news to celebrity journalism, that it is difficult to escape. This does not mean that mothers in the states do not talk back to this. They do. But when you have this misted by the media, almost into the, the, the media sea that we swim in and the air that we breathe, even if you're resisting this notion of the new momism, you have a sense that it is a standard that has become a common sense that other people will judge you by, even if you are resisting it. And that's the particularly pernicious power of this intensive mothering. And that's why it merits uh, an important and widespread critique. Because if you see it as some kind of gold standard uh, against which we're all going to be judged, then it's difficult to um, break out of it. Now, one of the things that is interesting in the United States is you're seeing really a real push-pull now here. There is ongoing pressure about intensive mothering. In the U.S., the highest moral ground you can take is to choose, and there's a whole discourse of choice in the United States, you choose to be a stay-at-home mother, no matter what the price. That's the choice that you make. Well, there are millions of mothers in the United States who cannot make that choice. They work because they have to, they need the money, end of story. But that is the discourse of choice. And so the morally righteous thing that you do is you choose to be a stay-at-home mother, the other element of this discursive formation is the wars against stay-at-home mothers and working mothers. Um, allegedly, we hate each other, um, but in fact, you can't win. If you're a stay-at-home mother, you're boring, and uh, you don't really have a life, and that means you really do have to bake cakes in the shape of Hogwarts, you know, <laughs> for every, like, school event, right? And if you're a working mother, you're selfish and don't really care about your children. Nobody has a place to stand. You know, so um, we're seeing, we're beginning to see a reaction against this. There are websites, there are political movements, there are even television shows that are starting to challenge this notion of intensive mothering. So this push-pull, there is a there is a pushback against this hegemonic formation, and and um, I'll just conclude by saying that at, at least in the United States, but I suspect elsewhere, um, motherhood remains the unfinished business of the women's movement.